Um, historically, she was the executive director of the Harvard Brook Research Foundation, and Harvard Brook is another LTEO, so she has a lot of wisdom to share here. <laughs> Thanks, Marie. Um, so this is another talk related to the flow of information and decision making, in this case it applies to management and policy decisions. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we mean by boundary spanning, share a few case studies, um, largely from Hubbard Brook and Harvard Forest, talk about how that relates to uh, a new communication strategy that's been developed by the LTR network, and how we're applying some of those ideas to the future scenarios proposal here for the Harvard Forest, and some potential future direct directions through a larger regional partnership. So boundary spanning is that work at the interface of science and policy, or science and management and conservation. So it's the person or the set of activities that has a foot in both, but isn't fully in one or the other. And the work is really um, centered around trying to enrich research by understanding what it is that people need to know, what kind of information would be useful, and also to improve the scientific basis for decision making uh, in ways that we all hope will um, diffuse and translate science for use in the public policy and other events. And I think this quote was developed by a paper um, by David Cash. So what do we mean by boundary spanning? Well, we know from the social science literature that there are several attributes that make boundary spanning more effective. One is that the work has to be credible. So that is high quality science. And the work that all of you do and the work of the LTR network, I think ranks right up there in terms of being high quality science. So that attribute, we can pretty much put a solid check mark by at least most of the time. It also has to be salient. Um, that it has to be delivered in a timely manner so that it's relevant to current questions. And it also has to be focused on addressing a, a problem or a question or a management and policy need. Um, this is something that I think we do um, pretty well in some cases, but not in all. And, but I also don't think that all science should be viewed through this lens. So saliency is important when the goal is to link the research to a policy and the process of boundary spanning should also be legitimate. That is, it should include the viewpoints of people other than the scientists who <coughs> research, so that you've engaged the community that you hope will use the information in the production of that knowledge and in understanding how that knowledge should be shared. So, um, Roger Pialki, this is kind of a controversial but interesting book and a very good read, short read, on the different roles and different ways that scientists do boundary spanning. Um, there are the pure scientists, and they, those, these are folks who don't ever wish to tip their toe into the policy management world. There's the science arbiter, and this is the person who provides facts in response to specific questions, basically. There's the issue advocate, and this is the scientist who chooses to basically wear a different hat from time to time and advocate a very strong position for policy and management. And then there's what the, he calls the honest broker. And I have to put honestly quote because it seems to me that's somewhat judgmental. But the idea here is that this is the point of view of someone who is trying to evaluate possible consequences of different policy decisions and without advocating a particular policy outcome, shares that information about consequences with decision makers. And then some of the tools of the trade um, include these tools listed here. Stakeholder engagement, how do we bring decision makers and managers into the research development process. Policy analysis. What are the policy questions? We heard a little bit about this um, <coughs> earlier. How do we analyze current policies to understand the questions that need to be addressed? But this, we can't just stop there. Then there's also government relations. Understanding how it is information is used in the decision making process. How does a bill become a law? How are plans and policies passed? How is the management process um, undertaken. Science communication, of course, this is the distillation of science into different <coughs> formats that are accessible to broad audiences. <coughs> and media outreach. Um, it would be interesting to ask the landowners to what extent they go to the media as an information source. I think a lot of people are increasingly use the internet as a, as a source of information and therefore being savvy about how to use journalists to convey scientific messages is important. One case study is from um, some work I did with colleagues at the Harvard 
Harvard Research Foundation. This program is about 10 years old now. We launched the program, it's called Science Links, after two years of study about boundary spanning activities and what makes them effective. Um, and this is a series of studies and reports that have come through the Hubbard Work Research Foundation related to this program. And we focused initially on um, atmospheric pollutants because that's very much a strain of the Hubbard Work Ecosystem Study. Um, one example of the use of science in the policymaking process is related to the mercury study. So each of these publications have one or more scientific publications associated with them. Most of them have several. And in the case of mercury, the policy question we were really trying to take on was this issue of whether or not the trading of mercury emissions from power plants would result in areas of either increased mercury deposition or um, higher concentrations of mercury in biota, contributing to what are called biological mercury hotspots. So EPA had recently made a statement in the Federal Register that they did not believe that there would be any hotspots after this new, a new rule was implemented. So through a series of, of three papers, we looked at um, data from across the region. It was gridded off for the region for mercury in loons and mercury in yellow perch. And we identified existing hotspots, biological hotspots of mercury in the landscape using known effects levels. So we used the EPA reference dose for the human health in yellow perch, and then we used a threshold for um, reproductive and behavioral effects in loons. So we published that paper and then published an additional paper that looked at EPA's approach to um, modeling emissions, atmospheric emissions from <coughs> power plants. And what we found was that in their model, which is a very coarse model, they actually were dramatically underestimating the contribution of local emission sources to mercury deposition across the landscape. So in fact, they didn't really have the tools to make such a statement. And when we did analysis looking at what would happen if you reduced emissions, we found that you actually, if you didn't reduce emissions from local sources, you would continue to see elevated deposition. So when that, um, when that work was published, we provided briefings to the assistant administrator at EPA, to members of Congress, and we also shared the results with the media. And this is just a summary of some of the results um, that this media coverage shows. The, um, the U.S. Court of Appeals basically um, required that EPA abandon its approach to allow the country hotspots. Um, there were new regulations put in place for the Bell Power Plant requiring that they install a scrubber, and that's at that site where we did that particular modeling analysis. New York Times actually <coughs> asked us to submit an op-ed they did run. And um, that's one of our colleagues, with Senator Collins, who at the time when we released the report, um, actually during the time of the Republican administration, introduced a new bill um, calling for the establishment of a national mercury, national mercury monitoring network. Uh, in the case of Harvard Forest, this is a very different type of model, um, but one that's also very interesting, I think. Um, we, here we worked with the teams from across uh, the region to produce two papers synthesizing um, forest ecology and information on conservation in the region into these two publications and calling for the accelerated pace of conservation in New England to stem the loss of forest land to, to development. And this was really, this really was grounded in the power of a strong narrative and the importance of telling a simple and clear story so less through analysis, more through synthesis and narrative and storytelling. And it did have, um, had, continues to have significant impacts. There was a 300 person conference held in Concord, New Hampshire, bringing together stakeholders from across the region to share that. Um, there's been a conservation finance bill introduced in the state of Massachusetts that grew out of actually the original Massachusetts based report. Um, Keith Ross has been um, spearheading an, an effort to do an aggregation of land protection efforts in Western Massachusetts as a model for how to accelerate conservation. Um, our colleagues at the High State Foundation have built a partnership of 60 some odd organizations in the region to help implement the vision. And Dave Orwig and Ed Basin here have launched a stewardship science project based in Parliament Court. So those are 
those are just two snapshots of some examples of boundary standing work. And even though this is, technically isn't social science, we have made an effort to assess the impact of our work. And so um, there's a paper coming out soon, hopefully, been accepted in bioscience, describing the Hubbard Brooks work. And then there's a paper in development that actually pulls case studies from several LTR sites across the world. <coughs> so we took these, many of these ideas and these examples and these approaches and tried to infuse it into an L a new LTR communication strategy. Let me take a poll. Has anybody heard of this document? Okay, people who had some direct involvement. <laughs>
In the pre-proposal phase, we've done a couple of things so far. Um, end of February, we went down to Washington, D.C. and engaged some national policy stakeholders in, in dialogue sessions. One was at the Heinz Center, and the other one was at NCSC, the National Council for Science and the Environment. And we also, um, David participated in a panel at the Library of Congress that was on large landscape scale conservation where we debuted some of this work as um, an example of how universities can serve as conservation catalysts. So for future directions, um, this actually is a statement from 2002 when the NSF did the 20 year review of the LTR program. And at that point, they basically said that LTR should assume a more powerful and pervasive role in information, in, in sharing information for environmental solutions at local, national, and international levels. So um, this work is something we think could do that quite well. And we are in early conversations about the possibility of building for the Northeast an LTR regional science and policy partnership. So we've held meetings yeah. here at the Harvard Forest with colleagues from Hubbard Brook, a few folks from MBL, and um, also with colleagues at the Cary Institute. And we'll be hopefully holding a workshop in the fall co-organized with Hubbard Brook looking at how it is we can actually institutionalize this work over time rather than a project here or a project there and do it across LTR sites in this region. I just wanted to acknowledge some of the many collaborators on this work, co-authors of paper, people who provided input to the case studies, and those who've worked on the future scenarios that